Hello, I am not a psychiatrist, but I have often been told that I should be seeing one on a regular basis, but who has the time? Whenever I am teaching Tai Chi or any other martial art, students often come to me and say, coach or shifu or guru or professor or sensei or, uh, hey kid, why is racism like a class three lever? Now I would have thought this to be self-evident, but let's review the basics, shall we? If you remember from grade three that there are three classes of lever, or lever if you live in a place where you, they spell it with two Vs. A lever, uh, involves a load, the thing you want to move, a fulcrum, the thing that you move it around, and the effort, the thing you move it with. A class one lever has the fulcrum in the middle, like a seesaw or a pair of scissors. A class two lever has the load in the middle like a crowbar or a wheelbarrow. A class three lever has the effort in the middle, like, like an idiot. With a class one and a class two lever, the mechanical advantage increases the, clo the more closely you get the load to the fulcrum, like this. This is more of an advantage than this. So, a class three lever always has a mechanical advantage of less than one. So why do we have class three levers at all if they don't provide a mechanical advantage? Well, the human body has lots of them. The arms act like class three levers, whether you're moving the elbow relative around the shoulder or moving the forearm around the elbow or, or moving the wrist and so on. You have the effort in the middle. So the bicep is pulling the forearm up and pivoting it around the fulcrum. This is a class three lever. When you move the elbow, you're using the muscles here to pull the elbow around the shoulder. And when you pull the elbow back, you're using the muscles on the back to pull the elbow around the shoulder. And likewise, like so. So the arms are class three levers. In Tai Chi, we learn to stabilize those class three levers and integrate them using tensegrity. Remember tensegrity from episode six? We align the tensegrity structure and stabilize the class three levers so that they become integrated with the rest of the body. And then the arms can become a contact point for class one levers or class two levers. So if I put the fulcrum on the axial line right here, any, either, any of them, and I pivot the pelvis around the hip, then the whole body, instead of turning like a wheel, swings like a door. And this way, I can put my arm here and push on something and I, it works like a class one lever, like this. If I connect the arm and stabilize it and I pivot around the right axial line, then I just let gravity do the work. It doesn't even take a lot of effort. And if I use the clever Tai Chi tricks of alignment and centripetal acceleration and focusing the vectors and so on, then I can use this class one lever to move the target. And I don't have to use any effort, I just have to relax the hip, like that. So this is a very easy way of transferring momentum into the target and sending it that way. If I use class three levers to interrupt that, so I use a class three lever here and a class three lever here, and what I end up doing is adding a bunch of uh, diffuse vectors of force so that instead of sending the thing I want to go that way with little effort, I use a lot of effort, it doesn't go as far and it ends up going off in the wrong direction. So the class three levers interfere with the result I'm trying to achieve. If I want to punch something, then I can use class three levers like a beginner 
or I can use my body weight and core power, we'll get into that stuff in another video, and proper alignment, but I let the tensegrity structure relax, and then I just let gravity do the punch. So let's see that again. I'm going to do it very gently. And I use, I stabilize the levers, this one and this one and this one, and that requires very little effort. Look at this tensegrity structure and see how loose all of the stabilizers are. These things are very loose and yet they are holding this very precisely in alignment. Okay? It doesn't take a lot of effort to hold it in one place, but if I want it to move then I have to tighten this up and it takes a lot of force and the amount of force required increases the more I want to move it and the more quickly I, I want to move it. From here, if I want to use a uh, class 1 lever, I pivot around the axial line and I just let my whole body swing open like a door and it requires little or no effort to punch. If I want to move the other way, I can tuck the elbow in and this can become a class 2 lever because the power is connected to my torso inside the axial line so that if I do that, this is a class 2 lever. And in the form that I teach, uh, I don't know many styles that still teach us anymore, but I have what's called the five punches sequence where the punches are all class 1 and 2 levers. So you have casting fist, you have punch down, punch up, back fist. So this is a class 2 lever, a class 1 lever, a class 1 lever, a class 1 lever. And all of these punches are pivoting around the axial line. You can pivot around this line, you can pivot around this line. So it, it uh, depends on the circumstance. If you have ever taught kickboxing or boxing, then you will be quite familiar with what I call self-defeating class 3 lever syndrome, or SDCTLS, or just CTLS, class 3 lever syndrome, cuddles. If you've taught somebody to punch, and you teach them the proper form and the right alignment, and then you put them up in front of a heavy bag for the first time, then all of their form goes out the window. People start using the muscle here and the muscle here and the muscle here and they tighten up and they separate the limb from the rest of the body. They break up that tensegrity and they end up throwing their fist using their arm muscles and you can tell them to please trust the technique, quit trying to force it and yet they keep doing that. You get them to do it right and they don't get the satisfaction of the resistance. They feel like they should be doing more. It's too easy. So they start adding more machismo to their punch and they start using more muscle. And of course the punch is not as effective. The vectors are diffuse. It just doesn't work well. When you teach them how to relax, then the punch is really effective, but it, it doesn't feel right. They don't feel like they're doing anything. It's too easy. And that's the same with, with Tai Chi and push hands. People get into mid-range and then they start resisting. They start engaging all of these class 3 levers that interfere with the function of the whole. The body starts fighting against itself. The different parts start you know, bracing and arguing with each other about who should be doing what. And then the vectors go off all in different directions. When you do a technique properly, it should be effortless. In fact, it should look fake. <laughs> That's the problem, of course, uh, because when it's done right, it looks fake and you often can't tell the difference between the fake stuff and the real stuff. If you're familiar with martial arts, you will see that often the finishing technique or the technique that really turns the tide is effortless. It's just an incidental thing. Many times you'll see a boxer get knocked out and it really doesn't look like much of a punch. But in fact, it was just good biomechanics. The person who was throwing the punch did it the right place, the right time, and had just enough mechanical advantage to transfer the momentum into the target. Suppose you're going to swing a sword. Beginners will swing a sword using class 3 levers. They'll use this and this, and they'll swing like that. If you align the body and think of it as a tensegrity structure, and you move the fulcrum to, say, over the hip or the waist, then instead of using class 3 levers, like this, you use a class 1 lever, like that. And so the hand and the arm don't do anything. 
the momentum is generated by the mass of the body and the fulcrum is here so that it moves the sword without using any effort in the arm at all. Isn't that cool? I think so. So from here, all I need to do is move my hip just a little bit and that moves the sword. And the hand just has to keep up with it. Well, then why do we have class three levers? Why do we, you know, there must be a point, for it, point to them. Lots of machines and certainly the body has lots of class three levers. And that is because sometimes strength is important. Yeah, sometimes physical strength is a mechanical advantage in itself. So building physical strength allows us to uh, stabilize those levers better, perhaps. Okay. Consider the difference between momentum and kinetic energy. Momentum uh, is mass times velocity. So if you have something really heavy, then the more mass you have, the more momentum you have. Also, the more velocity, the more momentum you have. But momentum, uh, with momentum, mass and velocity carry an equal weight. <laughs> and with kinetic energy, the formula is half of the mass times the square of velocity. So mass is, could be said to be half as important, and velocity is exponentially more important. So think of uh, momentum is like a big heavy truck moving not so fast, hitting a basketball. When the momentum gets transferred from the truck into the basketball, when the truck hits the basketball, the basketball is going to go a lot faster than the truck did. So momentum, you hit the target and the target goes quickly. With kinetic energy, if the basketball hits the truck very quickly, it's not going to move the truck very much. But if it's going very fast, it might damage the bumper or the grill or smash the windshield. Momentum is mass times velocity. Kinetic energy is half the mass times the square of the velocity. How does this apply in martial arts? Well, there's a difference between throwing somebody and hitting them. If you punch somebody, your main concern is going to be kinetic energy at the point of impact. How fast is your fist going when it hits? The amount of mass that you have behind the fist is also relevant. That is why heavyweights hit harder than lightweights. So you move very quickly, and the faster you can throw the punch, the more impact the punch is going to have. However, mass is still important. And with the levers inside the body, if you want to punch very fast, you can use compound levers inside the body and, and a really good internal power to generate effortless speed in the fist. So the punch can go quickly in spite of not having to use a lot of third class levers. So you can punch with a third class lever and if you're really strong and really fast, then you might be able to get enough velocity in your fist to have an impact on your opponent. But if you can get the more mass behind it and use compound levers, then you can actually make your fist go faster than if you use the third class levers. What the third class levers in the arms are good for is lateral power. So sideways energy. If I want to have a singular vector, then I will use the internal power, the centripetal engagement, I'll use my core strength, and I will use class one and class two levers to generate the kind of momentum and kinetic energy that I need in my punch, and I'll release like that. So the punch then, in this case, is released, and at impact, it is connected to the rest of the mass of the body. And when I, if I use a class one lever to punch, like that, or I use a class two lever to punch, either way, I have my body weight behind it, so that when I make an impact, I have a lot of velocity, but I also have a lot of momentum so that the mass of the body is large and it hits the target very quickly. And I need those muscles to stabilize me in order to keep my arm from going out of alignment. But that has to be relaxed. And I use a little bit of, there may be a little bit of extra energy at the end, depending on my level of skill and the, and the kind of structure that I've cultivated over time. But generally speaking, it's still going to be class one or class two levers. Class three levers are in combat, largely proprioceptive. I apply tension this way and tension this way. That enables me to feel where I am and it can have a certain effect on helping to stabilize the rest of the tensegrity structure. So as a person is pushing on my arm, if I feel this deformed, then I use that class three lever 
not to push them away, but to move me back into position. So if the person is pushing sideways on my arm, that's lateral pressure. That's warning to me that I'm not engaging properly. And instead of pushing against it and knocking myself off balance, instead I let myself relax and engage and restore that connection to the ground. And that enables me to go back to that singular vector that I'm trying to maintain. I want to have one line of force connecting my feet to my opponent. As soon as these class three levers get involved, then I'm starting to push sideways like that. And this will help to give me an idea of where the tension is. But the only reason I really want to know that in a fight is so that I can let go of it before the other person notices it. So these class three levers are really a way of pushing sideways, not a way of moving a fist forward, not a way of moving the opponent. My class three levers are really best as a way of moving me. And they move me back into a position where I'm using class one and class two levers. The purpose of a class three lever in the arms is to restore the class one and class two levers of the entire body. And not just the levers, all of the other simple machines within the body as well. So class three levers are important. They are useful for certain things. But in the case of combat, they're not really meant for punching or throwing. They're meant for improving the structure so that you can use class one and class two levers for throwing and punching. The problem is, of course, that people get mixed up. And when we start to lose our awareness and our understanding of what's happening, we become less concerned with the effective function and the actions that we're taking and more concerned with the proprioception. We need to redefine ourselves and our boundaries and understand our position in the world relative to all of the forces that are being applied to us. So when a person is attacking us and we don't really know what's going on, we tense up and we apply all of these third class levers in order to try to find where we are. And then if we're good, if we're really skilled, then we use those once we figure it out to move back into a position where we are integrated again and can start applying class one and class two levers again. So the problem is that people get trapped and they use class three levers as if they're going to do something instead of using the class three levers as a way of feeling their way back out of that class three lever situation. When we get tracked, trapped and we get stuck, then we get stuck in this pathology. It becomes a, a mental illness of sorts where we hold on to this tension. And when we come out of it, it's like a sort of a, a post-traumatic stress disorder where we carry this tension around with us, where we are at odds with our lives and with the situation that we've gotten ourselves into. And people walk around like this with tension because they are still fighting a fight that happened yesterday or last year or a long time ago or with our ancestors. So letting go of this, allowing it to integrate, allowing it to relax, allowing us to breathe and allowing us to function properly. It's not easy. You need to do it. You need to practice it. And that's why we have to have daily practice. That's why we have to do things like scenario training. If the, if the tensegrity structure is aligned properly, then every part of the body is contributing to the power. If a third class lever gets in there and thinks that it's better than the rest of it, then it interferes with the whole thing and the body starts to fight against itself. So rule number one in martial arts, don't beat yourself up. Don't fight yourself. So that's why we need to relax. All martial arts teach this. You need to relax, you need to align, you need to trust the technique, and you need to condition yourself to trust the technique. That's why we do scenario training. Lots of people have great technique, they have great form when they're practicing in class against no opponent at all. In fact, they, they end up resisting a lot and using a lot of tension. But as soon as they get into a realistic situation, all of that training goes out the window. So if you have never actually done scenario training, and I don't just mean sport fighting. I don't just mean uh, going into the ring or the octagon or the Sancho or the Lei Tai platform. I mean uh, actual scenario training. And every once in a while throw a monkey wrench into the machinery to test your ability to adapt and to maintain those principles. You need to do this. This applies not just, of course, to martial arts, but to life in general and how we interact with other people. We train to let all of the different parts of the body communicate with each other. And 
when they communicate and when they work together, then we can create a machine that is much more useful and much more powerful than the sum of its parts. And all of the different functions and all of those differences contribute to creative solutions. With Tai Chi, we do a small movement that gets the other person off their base of support and gets them fighting themselves. So a little movement with a little bit of leverage can cause the other person to tighten up and start using those class three levers. And then we can continue effortlessly with a, another machine and knock the person out or put them on the ground. Class one and class two levers provide a mechanical advantage. They also demonstrate intelligence and require a lot less effort to move the target. And with them, we can overpower bigger and stronger opponents. Used properly with the tensegrity structures of the human body, they allow us to maximize pressure per square inch and use force much more effectively. So we can focus the vectors more effectively with class one and two levers working with tensegrity than we can when we start to isolate different parts of the body using class three levers. In combat, they depend on a great deal of effort. And as such, they are sort of an affirmation of strength. We use class three levers because they are inefficient. We can feel it. Right? They allow us to feel the resistance, uh, which reassures us of our involvement in the fight. Use of class three levers explores the limits of our physical strength and the extent of our proprioception. Right, so it gives us a feeling of where the boundaries are. When you tighten up the arms, you tighten up the shoulders, and you, you apply active resistance in one direction or another, this sort of defines where you are. That's why when people lose control in a fight, when they are afraid and they lose their awareness, then they tighten up because they know something's coming, but I don't know where. Or they lash out like that. People tense up and they use these class three levers as sort of a, a, a tentacles proprioceptive tools for feeling which way the vectors are coming from. And when they don't know where the vectors are coming from, they tense up everything in all directions. And they either contract and withdraw, or they lash out, sacrificing their own balance in either case, in order to try to defeat the opponent wherever it is, they don't know where, fishing around in the dark for something to fight against. Class three levers have a use. But and the use of class three levers limits our awareness and interferes with uh, the cultivation of higher level skill and higher levels of consciousness. The reliance on physical strength is usually a bigger problem for bigger students. It's usually more of a syndrome when you've got a student who is really strong and is accustomed to the strength working for them. When a student relies on the strength, and they never learn how to transcend that, that attachment to those class three levers, then they are at quite a loss when they come up against a higher level of skill. And they never reach that higher level of skill. As an example, um, several years ago, I had a couple of students who used to train together a lot. One was a ballerina about five feet tall, and the other was a welder geologist pipe fitter. And he was strong like bull and smart like tractor but big, strong guy, handsome fellow, very strong. So when he was doing toy show or doing any other exercises with the other students, when it came down to it, he could always recruit his muscular strength and he could overpower the other students. And the ballerina learned very quickly that class three lever syndrome did not work for her. So she had to develop higher level of skill and her level of skill was much less than his strength. And gradually, her level of skill improved, but he wasn't getting that much stronger. And his skill was improving much more slowly than hers was. And he would reach these plateaus and get stuck there because his strength kept working for him. And as a, as a teacher, it would have been my job to show him that the strength wasn't working for him. Unfortunately, at the time, my skill level wasn't great enough to demonstrate properly, either as a teacher or as a, as a martial artist. But she improved until one day he fell on the ground. And then the next class he, he did it twice. He fell on the ground. And then one day he looks over at me and goes, yeah. So and I said, well, remember I talked about relaxing? I, I think it has something to do with that. So your strength can be your weakness. Likewise, your weaknesses can be your strength. That is a fundamental principle in life as well as in martial arts.
So, so class one and class two levers allow us to relax and balance the alignment of the body. They maintain the tensegrity that allows us to make changes instantaneously by improving both function and awareness. Class three levers require us to send efferent neurons to tell the body what to do. Whereas if you can stabilize it and stabilize that tensegrity, then you can relax and you have more useful afferent neurons telling you what's going on, but you also have the connection, the connective tissue working together and every part of the body listens to every other part of the body. With this tension, you have the brain trying to communicate to all of the different parts of the body. They don't get to work together, and then you end up requ requiring this sort of vertical hierarchy. So you have this authority up here trying to tell all the different parts of the body what to do, and has to because all of the different parts are fighting against each other. Hmm? Anyway, when you relax and you let go of that brain power, you let the mind become calm and empty, and you relax the body, then the body communicates with itself. And that tensegrity structure, that fascia, becomes a sense organ in itself. And then you have this more horizontal uh, command structure where everybody is listening and everybody is responding. So it becomes this one big coherent mind that works much more effectively and is much easier to balance than having a whole bunch of different parts being commanded from the top. So a lot of the times people have a sense of balance that is determined when they are young and they have to train to get better at balancing. So your sense of balance is pretty much worked out by the time you're six or seven years old, but your ability to improve your balancing skill, that can be worked on at any age. So I'm much better at balancing now than I was when I was a teenager, strangely enough. Okay, which isn't that great, but still, it's better than I was. So this tensegrity can allow all of the different machines in the body, all the levers and screws and pulleys and wheels and incline planes and so on, to work together and to transfer momentum and kinetic energy in really surprising and very counterintuitive ways. But the use of them in combat requires a high level of self-awareness, technical conditioning, and scenario training in order to avoid self-defeating class three lever syndrome. And this happens to, to everybody, all kinds of martial arts, all kinds of sports. It happens all over the place. I have students who are involved in a lot of different martial arts, a lot of different sports, and we see it in the biomechanics and the way that people move all the time. And a little change, a different way of thinking about the body, and all of a sudden the person can hit the ball farther, run faster, change direction faster, generate more power with less effort, and so on. I have a, a student who is a very, very strong guy. He spent a lot of time and energy working on his strength. He is a, well, he's literally a strong man. And also a soldier and a jujitsu instructor. And he was mentioning that when he would be rolling with his students and his classmates in his jujitsu class, that one of the comments that he would get was, Oh, you're so strong. Everything you do, you're just so strong. And then he would have to point out to them that he wasn't using strength. But because he was so strong, they assumed that it was his muscular strength that gave him the advantage. In fact, he was quite relaxed and he wasn't using that muscular strength. He was using the other skills, the, the more advanced skills that exist in Tai Chi and in Jiu Jitsu and a bunch of other martial arts. In Tai Chi, we make a big deal of it because that's kind of our thing. But other martial arts have it as well. And a lot of other martial artists are much better at, at Tai Chi stuff than a lot of Tai Chi people are. It's just sort of the way it goes, isn't it? But if you have ever taught martial arts, then you will know that people are quite capable of being stupid. And I'm not just speaking about uh, stupid people or beginners or people with some kind of unusual deficiency. I'm talking about experts, martial arts masters, geniuses, professional people at the top of their field. They're all quite capable of being stupid. In fact, I often find that it's the smart people, the really educated people, that are sometimes the most susceptible to 
self-defeating class three lever syndrome, and sometimes very, very difficult to teach. You can teach a person the correct way to punch, but it takes a long time and a lot of practice with a lot of constant reminders to get the student to actually trust the technique instead of always adding more tension. They keep adding more weight, adding more tension. You hope that they get it sooner than later so that they don't dislocate their shoulder when they hit a heavy bag. But as soon as you turn your back on them, they will often go back to just creating that interference with their own power. A friend of mine was competing in a toy show competition. That's Tai Chi push hands. It's a little bit like a mid-range, it's a mid-range grappling uh, skill. Sometimes it's a little bit like sumo wrestling. Uh, the idea is to use your skill and as little force as possible to toss the other person to the ground or move their feet or push them off the platform. So my friend was in the toy show competition and he advanced so far as to get pitted up against one of his own teachers, a woman about half his size. But they got to a high enough level where they combined the weight classes and she told him not to take it easy on her. Right? To be competitive and to do his best and not defer to her because of either her rank or her size. Uh, <laughs> so he did his best. And at one point, thinking that he could overpower her, you know, looking at them, you'd assume he should be able to. Uh, but assuming that he could overpower her, he used the class three lever and he ripped his bicep. We heard it across the auditorium and it just sort of rolled right up. Now, fortunately, we were in Canada and he's a Canadian and he was able to get it fixed without mortgaging his house. But he did learn his lesson. <laughs> there is a core principle in Tai Chi that is often translated as use the mind and not force. Now, since the Star Wars movies came out, that kind of talk invokes images of Jedi mind tricks and telekinesis. But the real meaning of that saying, use the mind and not force, is probably better translated as use your brain, don't force it. Or let everything follow your intention, don't fight yourself. This seems like a clear enough idea, but people are stupid. And I mean all people are stupid. If you are a smart person and you look down on stupid people, I have news for you, you're not that smart. If you are the smartest person on the planet, that's not saying much. You're still only comparing yourself to other humans. And it's not really that impressive. I have taught some real geniuses and when it comes to self-defeating lever syndrome, smart people can be real idiots. Believe me, I'm one of the smartest people I know and I'm a moron. Just ask anybody I've ever dated. Uh, it usually takes a long time for me to realize when I am being stupid. Stupid things seldom seem stupid when you are doing them. There are frequent exceptions, however, but we won't get into those. That's not the point of this talk. Now, I can assure you that I am not one of those people who deliberately tries to be stupid. In fact, I try to be as smart as possible, but the human being is by nature a complex system which, if not constantly managed and maintained absolutely precisely, is prone to automatically behaving stupidly. We suffer from systemic stupidity. The system generates stupidity all by itself. If we don't work really hard to make ourselves and the system itself smarter, we can't just know what's right and assume that the right things are going to happen we have to constantly work to make the actual system work in a smarter way. Lots of people learn about Tai Chi, they learn about levers, they learn about self-defeating class three lever syndrome, and yet in practice, it all falls apart because we don't maintain the system properly. So this is why we must rehearse various situations. Martial artists need to do scenario training so that we can condition ourselves to do the smart thing automatically instead of leaving it to chance, trusting that we will do the smart things automatically just because we want to be smart. Pilots and astronauts do it, doctors do it, nurses do it, uh, paramedics, anywhere that it's important, you'd think they should be doing scenario training. In some places, the police do it. But we rehearse standard operating procedure and we don't just read about them. 
But martial arts teach us to acquire mechanical and psychological advantage over a bigger and stronger opponent. I've been tossed across the room by little old ladies half my size and nearly breaking my many martial arts trophies. They can do this because the human body has a remarkable design. It's like a Swiss army knife capable of providing any number of simple machines. Like, like I said, levers, wedges, screws, pulleys, gears, wheel and axle, incline planes, bows and springs, compound machines, kinematic chains, self-locking machines, and one of my favorites, of course, the Galilean cannon. The efficiency of these machines depends on the harmony of the mind and body and the proper use of tensegrity structures. But when that tensegrity is compromised or perturbed by internal tensions or mental distractions, then all of these different levers work against each other in a way that corrupts the intent. But physical tension and emotional turmoil turn that single structure into a bunch of class three levers and send vectors of force off in all directions. It destabilizes the whole body and makes it really easy for opponents to de destabilize us even more. Martial arts, uh, especially the so-called internal martial arts, uh, teach us to take advantage of tensegrity structures to apply the most efficient versions of those machines but ego and insecurity cause us to compromise our own power and make us fight against the best interests of ourselves and our group. Fear and insecurity cause us to tense up, that dividing ourselves into sort of conflicting parts. Uh, we contract or we lash out. Uh, we either weaken ourselves by retreating within ourselves or completely destable ourselves by lashing out at the perceived enemy. But when we train our mind and body to seek balance and harmony within ourselves and become more powerful and efficient, then it becomes increasingly difficult for other people to destabilize us. Then we can use our own balance and harmony and extend it into the sphere of the enemy, disrupting their aggression and allowing them to find their own balance and harmony so they won't want to fight us anymore. Sometimes that manifests as negotiation and conflict resolution and sometimes as a last resort it results in a short-term solution where the enemy finds their balance and harmony lying unconscious on the ground. One of my students knocked me off my feet one day and uh, she said, well that was easy, I was just looking for the part of your mind that wanted to get pushed over. She would not have been able to do that if she had been fighting herself. So this is a sort of an ideal, but if we don't practice it and don't deal with it diligently, then we end up with this sort of creeping escalation of class three lever syndrome. We increase the amount of conflict within ourselves and with other people. If we are in conflict with ourselves, that will affect those around us and lead to this creeping escalation. We tense up in response to outside aggression, perceived or real, which makes us less stable, which makes us tense up more, causing more misalignment and overcompensation, which then threatens our neighbors, which makes them withdraw or lash out. And before you know it, we are at war. And no one ever wins a war. You know, meaningful victory only happens when all parties are actively working toward the best interests of everyone. In geopolitics, wars often continue for centuries after the last battle has been fought and the last treaty has been signed. World War II was really a continuation of World War I, which was a continuation of feudal patterns that go back to the Middle Ages. And as for World War II, we are still seeing tensions that are left over from that a century later. Another example is a war that was supposed to have been over in 1865, yet the tensions are clearly still there. The war between different parts of the body doesn't end until the whole body realizes that there is no enemy. It's all imaginary. The class three levers relax and stabilize and every part is connected and communicating with every other part. But until that horizontal communication happens, 
and we are not all just fighting over vertical hierarchies, it's never going to be stable. We're never going to end the war. So when we train, when we do martial arts, we practice balancing the body, aligning the mind, learning not to fight ourselves. When we get really good at not fighting ourselves, then we can learn how not to fight the other person. In negotiation, there's a thing called the integrative negotiation versus distributive negotiation. And the way that it was explained to me was that distributive negotiation is people arguing over a pie to see how much everyone can get. Integrative negotiation was with everybody basically being on the same team and saying, well, how can we all get more pie? Let's talk to the baker. Uh, see if we can work out a deal. And then that harmony expands outwards until eventually everyone is working that way. But this antagonism, this tendency for human beings to fight against each other is really just an expression of the natural tendency for human beings to fight against themselves. There is something about human nature that makes us want to fight ourselves. In many ways, I think that it is actually part of an evolutionary advantage. The interaction of yin and yang creates everything. Diversity is our strength. Diversity is a catalyst for creation. Diverse opinions are the touchstone of uh, invention and creative solutions. But we also like to belong. Uh, we have a predisposition for team sports that allow us to be part of something bigger than ourselves. And we do that by clearly defining ourselves as different from something else. So you have to wear this uniform, this baseball cap, so that we know what team you're on. And we relish cheering for our own team, even if that team really has nothing really to do with us specifically and really is not any different from any other team. But we like to differentiate from things in order to experience singularity with one thing. And we like to have differences and see the differences because that increases our creativity and there are some benefits to team sports. Tai Chi is one of those exercises that people think of as being non-competitive, but it is a martial art and there is a very clear competitive aspect to it. And that competition and that learning how to deal with the conflict and the differences between us and other people allows us to find harmony within ourselves and then we expand that to include harmony with other people. So competition, friendly competition, definitely has its value. People say there should be no competition in Tai Chi. Well, of course, that's ridiculous because of the, if you think of the ancient Taoist proverb, you got Ami Shunren, Yu Da Bong Cho, but basically it means even the Amish people play baseball. But no one is born racist, just as no one is born a Toronto Raptors fan. But people from Toronto to Iqaluit, from St. John's to Vancouver, were all cheering for Canada's team which had two Canadians on it when it won the NBA championship. We were all chanting, we the North, for a team that is from a city at the same latitude as South Dakota. But they won the NBA championship. <laughs> it's as if we all became one team in Canada based on the color of our jerseys and on what side of the border we lived on, an imaginary border. So team sports bring us together by defining us in opposition to something else. And that same psychology applies to individuals and it's used as a tool by authoritarian regimes and by antagonistic countries. They try to sow dissent within the, the enemy country and get the country fighting itself so that they don't have to worry about it as a threat. As individuals, we try to do the same thing. It, it's Newton's third law applied to human identity. We want to define ourselves to know who we are, so we look for something to fight or to push against or to bang our heads against. And that resistance defines us. We find it reassuring. In times of stress, being able to create pressure gives us the illusion that we can control our boundaries. It gives us the illusion that we exist. You've watched students hitting the heavy bag as inefficiently as possible. You've told them, trust the technique, don't just muscle through it or you'll hurt yourself more than the other guy. Then you turn your back for a minute and the student is doing it again. They're hitting the bag as if their goal in life is to dislocate their shoulder. This strange quirk of human nature is apparent when we use those same machines in a way that puts us at a disadvantage. We essentially use the machines backwards. We hold the wrong end of the drill. We 
make our work much more difficult than it should be. We put the load too far from the fulcrum. We use the wrong kind of lever because our ego, our ignorance, and lack of self-awareness causes us to fight ourselves. We often fight ourselves even when there is no opponent. When there is an opponent, we continue to fight ourselves, but we also tend to fight the enemy in the least efficient way possible. We seem to succumb to egotism and fear and end up fighting against the strongest and most fearsome advantage that the opponent presents. Instead of getting out of the way of the fist, we go uh, like this and try to stop the fist. We stand right in the line of the train and go, no, like that, rather than getting off the tracks and maybe even hopping on board. Basically, we weaken ourselves and then use the opponent's strength against us. So the first challenge that we face as martial artists is to learn how to avoid fighting ourselves because you cannot effectively fight the enemy and yourself at the same time. So the rule number one is don't beat yourself up. The second challenge is an extension of that skill, and that is to avoid fighting the enemy. Victory is never complete until you are both on the same team. That means that the body has to be in harmony with itself. Every part has to be working together to serve the same intent. The different parts cannot be in conflict with each other. With regards to the opponent, harmony should be your starting point. Don't use force against force. Follow their intent. Join with their force. Pivot around the point of engagement. Let them do what they want to do, but in a way that is not a threat to you. If you're a beginner, this may seem like a lofty or even an impossible goal, but that is because beginners are so consumed with inner conflict that they cannot conceive of being in harmony with an attacker. Now, the second principle is you will not defeat your enemy. They must defeat themselves. So don't add weight to the conflict. Discover the part of the opponent that wants to lose and then let them. So when you move your body, don't add weight. Don't try to find the least efficient way to move. Try to move in a way that is completely effortless. And you can continually refine this and make moving easier and easier and easier. When you're pushing a lawnmower, don't hang on it. Don't apply third class levers. See if you can engage the ground in a way that just allows the lawnmower to float along by itself. Opening doors, closing doors, picking things up. Try to find the most efficient ways to do things. Think about those class one and two levers and see if you can notice when you're using class three levers and you shouldn't be. And when you move your body, don't add weight. When you engage the opponent, don't add weight. There is a misconception that martial arts are about learning to be violent. But that is like saying that medicine is about learning to be sick. Violence is what happens when you do not practice a martial art. Whether that martial art includes punching or kicking or grappling or conflict resolution or meditation or mediation or social services. As a martial artist, I am never truly successful until I have made peace with myself and made peace with the world. That is the whole point of martial arts. Even where perfect peace seems impossible, the quest for it is the most reliable path to victory. Peace is power. Beginners think that the way to achieve peace is to be powerful, but with practice you realize that the way to achieve power is to be at peace. In the context of personal self-defense, this means that you must perpetually cultivate a healthy and relaxed body and a calm mind while you are not under attack. I am sometimes asked, how can I be expected to have a calm mind when somebody is lunging at me with an axe? And I say, you should practice having a calm mind when someone is not lunging at you with an axe. Most people do not have calm minds. They just don't pay attention, so it doesn't bother them. So they end up being pushed around and manipulated by their own minds because they're not realizing how subtle their own thoughts are, how subtle their own emotions are, and how precisely we can manipulate ourselves without even knowing it. Hmm. Yeah. Like I said, stupid? Yeah, yeah that's me. 
is balance is a verb. Peace is not something that you can achieve and then forget about. A building must be constantly maintained or else it will eventually deteriorate and collapse. And the more you neglect it, the more quickly it will deteriorate. So peace and harmony must be actively cultivated. It's like paddling a boat upstream. If you stop paddling, you go backwards. But the river is faster in some places than it is in others. And it's also subject to the whims of nature. So constant vigilance makes balancing easier. Too many people reach the calm water, then fall asleep, stop paddling, and they're completely unaware of the fact that they're drifting towards a waterfall. And the water doesn't seem all that fast until it becomes too fast to do anything about it. And they are suddenly caught in the rapids. If we get surprised by violence, it's not enough to just blame the river. We, the paddlers, must take responsibility. It's not about guilt, it's not about blame, it's about responsibility. We are all responsible, even the innocent, especially the innocent. This awareness requires an emotional state, an emotional harmony and relaxation and empathy. Love is a superpower. In The Art of War, Sun Tzu quotes a famous military maxim. He says, know your enemy and know yourself and you will never be defeated even if you face a hundred battles. Now, it's essential to remember you can't learn anything about anyone by hating them. True mastery is love. That goes for martial arts, goes for everything else really. But in martial arts especially, true mastery is love. This is not just some utopian dream uh, or some idealistic fantasy. Love is a practical tool for making you a better fighter. Empathy is a tactical advantage in life and in warfare. In other words, if you want to be able to really effectively kick the snot out of somebody, you have to start by loving them unconditionally. Now, if you want to be able to read an opponent's mind and manipulate their intent, you must cultivate self-awareness until that awareness expands to include other people. And we have this, this state of, of what we call no enemy, and that is where we cease to see ourselves as a separate entity, an ego. We transcend that whole idea that we can be clearly defined. That, oh, that. where do we end? At the arm or the hand? What if we lose those? Do we cease to exist? What about the air that we breathe? That's not us. The cells move and they change. So our existence is not merely defined by our physical body and the physical boundaries or the things that we do or the things that we have. These are just experiences and we are really no more than the awareness of the experience of these things. And from a combat perspective, that becomes practical when it is applied to strategy and long-term goals. The students ask, oh, well, how can I be expected to read an opponent's mind? Well, you practice first by reading your own mind. Regular daily practice will allow you to recognize the relationships between thought, emotion, and posture and you will be able to recognize these things in other people. Then you don't have to wait for the punch. You can intercept the punch before it is thrown. You can neutralize the intent or the emotion behind it or the cause of the emotion or the source of the cause of the emotion or the systemic issues that lead to the violence in the first place. There are forces in the universe that seem beyond your control and beyond your jurisdiction. But we should assume responsibility for all of it. There should be no limit in our search for understanding of ourselves or of the universe. We need, we need to expand our awareness in order to adapt to infinite change. And as impossible or far-reaching as that is, we can do that by the simple process of paying attention to ourselves. This is sort of what we mean by be the change that you want to see in the world. If you want to have power, you must have peace. 
So we must have peace. So you cultivate that peace internally, learn to achieve harmony with yourself, and then expand that and perpetuate it in the world at large and the universe. But responsibility is not the same as guilt, and this is not about blame, of course. The innocent are re as responsible as the guilty. Martial arts are not concerned with revenge, contrary to what you may have seen in any number of movies or novels. Martial arts are concerned with the cultivation of peace. We train to be appropriate and righteous and brave, but not vindictive. So, class three lever syndrome. What does that have to do with racism? Well, racism is an example of humanity fighting with itself. It's stupid and quite literally self-defeating. People take up sides based on the most ridiculous of criteria. It's an emotional response to systemic problems. One should think that the idea that people could be so stupid is in itself ridiculous, but we are that stupid. Politics and advertising want you to fit into an identifiable demographic. If we identify with a political party or a religion or a sports team or a fashion choice or a hair color, if we fit into a category, then they can design an emotional campaign targeted just at us. And we fall for it. It is predictable. It is inherent in the system. That is what systemic racism means. It means we fall for it. And if we identify with a race other than the human race, then we have fallen for it. It's a mental illness to think that somehow pigment has anything to do with any other characteristic. So if we identify with a race other than the human race, or we identify with whatever political party we voted for in the last election, we have fallen for it. If we identify as a blonde or a brunette or a redhead, or freckled, or male, or female, or Christian, or Buddhist, or Muslim, or atheist, then we have fallen for it. If we identify as not having any identity at all, then we have fallen for it. Because we're differentiating ourselves from people who do have an identity. If we identify as either being a racist, or as being definitely too smart to be a racist, then we have fallen for it. If we put ourselves into a category that can be manipulated by good storytellers, we have fallen for it. And we can blame it on some sort of hierarchical command structure. Yeah, maybe. But we must take responsibility for it, every single one of us. In the past, the class system was an easy way to categorize people. You could categorize a person according to their wealth or education. You could identify them by their clothes or their accent or their table manners. But then society started doing away with that idea by allowing upward mobility. You could be rich then without a fancy accent or without any kind of table manners. You could be rich and wear coveralls or a thong. Didn't matter. But skin color is a difficult thing to change. That makes it one of those extremely convenient tools for categorizing and manipulating people. It's one of those things that doesn't say anything about you except for what team people expect you to play on. It's like a team jersey or a baseball cap, and we fall for it. And we expect people to behave like their category. We see a pale teenager playing NWA on his car stereo, and we want to say, Hey, Earth to Caucasian! Are you trying to be black? Or we see a dusky fellow practicing kung fu in the park, and our brain says, part of it says, Hey, Bruce Leroy, you trying to be Chinese? And of course, it's more profitable to market to the largest demographic, so minorities always get a bad deal. One result is that we marginalize entire swaths of the population, making it harder for them to contribute, both to their own lives and to society as a whole. And we all suffer for that. When women are oppressed, half of the population is prevented from contributing to the best of their abilities. And that means that half of the brain power of the world is being stifled. I don't find it surprising that most of the countries that were most successful in the fight against the COVID-19 pandemic are either countries where women are currently holding high office or countries where the chance of having a female leader is approximately 50%. When minorities are oppressed, the entire socioeconomic system is like a car with one or two flat tires. And when we oppress some of us, 
we suppress all of us. Racism is just society making life difficult for itself by clinging to ridiculous notions of identity for marketing purposes, mostly. I blame Hollywood, advertising, education, political campaigns, and all of the people who get suckered in by them. Martial arts are not typically team sports, but since a person is the basic unit of society, it makes sense to me that a single person will exhibit the same pathology that we see in society as a whole. A person trying to learn a martial art will invariably exhibit the same syndrome on a smaller scale. We are essentially racist toward different parts of our own bodies. We treat some parts as if they are more important than others, but we don't use any consistency or logic when we do it. We will oppress or suppress different parts of our own body or our own mind that make us uncomfortable. And we suppress different parts of our personality in a way that weakens us and provokes rebellion from other aspects of ourselves. If we ignore the value and requirements of our vertebrae, our knees, or our ankles, then we inevitably face a revolt of some kind, and we pay for it. As a tactic, class three levers have limited value. But as a strategy, provoking class three lever syndrome in the opponent is a time-honored practice. When you can get the other person to fight themselves, you can achieve remarkable success in battle. However, unstable neighbors lead to unstable neighborhoods, and provoking instability inevitably is disastrous for our own long-term survival. People can achieve power by getting other people to fight against each other. People can achieve power by fighting against themselves. <laughs> but it's not good for long-term survival. Friendly competition is great for creativity, but the development of the species is stopped or even reversed by self-defeating class three lever syndrome and racism. It's no wonder the aliens have not contacted us yet. We are not ready. <laughs> Could you imagine giving a warp drive to a society like ours? What would happen if we were to spread out through the galaxy the way we are right now? Unless we learn how to function together and to <laughs> stop picking sides for the stupidest of reasons. Yeah. Makes me sad, but who knows? Maybe we will get through this. Wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't that be really, really cool? If we could just all of a sudden just get along. <sighs> I remain hopeful. We've certainly seen worse times. Let's give it a chance, shall we? So, very good. More practice. Congratulations on making it to the end of one of my videos. That is quite an accomplishment. If you would like to see more of these videos, then please visit SinclairInternalArts.com where you can make a one-time donation, or subscribe, or sign up for a private online lesson. If you would like to see fewer of these videos, that is going to cost you.